Uh, six hours. <laughs> Hello there, everybody. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I am the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of No Hassle Newsletters, my done-for-you newsletter program used by over 1,200 small business owners over the last 10 years. But most importantly, today, right now, as we're getting together, I'm the host of Dream Business Radio, my weekly podcast created to help you build your dream business. This is episode 576. My special guest today is Barbara Mason. Barbara, how are you doing today? I'm great. Glad to be here. I'm very excited. We, we, Everybody who does a podcast knows you get together five minutes early, and it's a good thing we did because we're both yeah. <laughs> little, little technical demons, but that's why you do it. That's right. Anyway, Hey folks, this episode of Dream Business Radio is brought to you by, yes, the incredible Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur who wants to grow a more profitable business faster, if you'd like to learn how to create multiple streams of revenue, something I've been very, very good at for the last, um, well, 15 years or so, you want to look at this group led by me, Captain Jim, at dreambizcoaching.com. That is dreambizcoaching.com. Speaking of multiple streams of revenue, one of my... Um, Latest ebooks that I've just put out. Well, this one actually came out two months ago, which is how to create multiple streams of revenue in your business. It's about a 12 page book. I take you from when I started my first business in 2001 up to about six different businesses. I tell you exactly how I did that, what the mindset was, and how I got them going. You get this free ebook. Download it now at Create Multiple Streams of Revenue. That is create multiple streams of revenue.com. All right, let me pr properly introduce Barbara as if I would improperly <laughs> introduce Barbara and we'll dive into this most important topic. Uh, Barbara Mason is the founder of Career Pathways Consulting and she has helped countless high performance women entrepreneurs hire, grow and retain amazing teams so they can position their companies for long-term success with more than 20 years of HR experience working for Fortune 500 companies, Barbara honed her organizational development and talent management skills on the front lines of corporate America. And among many accomplishments in her impressive resume, she is she led the HR strategy at a 9,000 person organization. <laughs> I don't know any entrepreneurs who go, I'm going to have 9,000 people, but it did happen there. And she also created the staffing process for Target's distribution division on how to open and staff a 1 million square foot distribution center. So she really knows what she's doing in this area. Her current work includes helping million dollar small businesses build their teams and build solid employee culture. Barbara, welcome again to Dream Business Radio. I'm, Thank I'm excited. Thank you so to, much. Yeah. So this is a really important topic. You know, people know me I've been doing this for over 10 years the the podcast I love marketing I love branding I love all the things of scaling and business but if you're going to scale and grow a business and you eventually have to get out of that chief cook and bottle washer mode that means bringing on your first employee and then perhaps yeah. all the way up to 9000 I don't know but this is a really important topic that I think a lot of people are unprepared for and when I promoted this episode Oh, I'm taxing my my feeble memory. It's how to hire smart and what what was the fast? I think how to hire fast. That's right. And um, so anyway, I was really excited to talk to you. But I before I dive in, I always like just just a little bit of background, other than the professionally written resume. So when did yeah. you did you like in fifth grade say I'm going to have a career in HR? HR looks awesome. Like what <laughs> led know, that, that path? <laughs> that would be a cool story. And it's not my story. Okay. All <laughs> so, right. So, no, I didn't um, necessarily decide I wanted to be in HR in fifth grade. I actually was a computer science major. Is that college. right? I wow. was a computer science major, which is like the opposite part of your brain. Yeah. Um, I did some work um, at NASA when I was in high school as part of like the summer science program and was really intrigued. And the engineers there talked me into going into computer science. I did it for two and a half years in college. And literally my junior year in college, I walked out of physics class, went to my advisor. I lost every scholarship I had because it was oh. all science related and said, I want to do this. And she was like, are you are you kidding me? I'm like, nope, don't want to do it. I don't like it. Um, and I could do the work, but it did not excite me. Mm. It was very boring to me. Okay. Um, and literally I went to lunch with a friend um, that day and I was like, hey, I'm changing my major. She's like, what too? I was like, I don't know. And she's like, why don't you do HR? You get to hire and fire people. And I'm like, oh, huh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. 
It happened literally just like that. Now, because, you know, God smiles on those that are, you know, ignorant sometimes, it worked out in my favor. I absolutely love HR and it's a perfect fit for me, but mm. that's my story. Okay. And I'm sticking to it. All right. So, you know, first of all, the one year I went to college and I took a computer class, it was Fortran. It was like these punch cards. Yes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm guessing like you don't, you've never four. heard of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I think ho holds up a lot of entrepreneurs who do want to scale and go into growth mode is when do I hire? And by the way, I'm using the term hire as in whether you have a W2 employee or whether you grow a team with virtual assistants like I did. I've never had an employee. Right. And um, but I had a team of 16 virtual assistants at one point down to about four of them now. Actually, well, but anyway, when when is when does an opportunity or what is the best opportunity for an entrepreneur who is almost like self-described overwhelmed mode, got a lot of things going on. Boy, I wish I could get my book done. Or I wish I could do this, that other thing. But yet they refuse to hire. What is that mechanism? How do you help people with that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, um, it's one thing is mindset first and thinking about why don't you want to hire? And so mm -hmm. I hear all kinds of things about why. Oh, it's too hard. Can I find somebody who's going to do it just the way I want? Can I find somebody who's dependable? I can't afford it. So there's always these blocks about why they won't do it. And so I try to listen and attack that first and try to go one by one through those myths or blocks. Okay. Right. Um, and so one of the biggest things is, you know, I can't afford to hire. And I always say, well, can you afford not to? That's right. Um, the next thing is talking about what are your business goals, right? And so do you want to increase your revenue? Because if you want to increase your revenue or, or scale, as they call it, then how can you do that as just one person? Mm -hmm. Barbara, do you, um, you know, that's interesting. People say I can't afford to, yet they're stuck, whether they're stuck at six yes. figures or not even six figures or they can't get to like half a million, but yet I'm stuck, but I can't afford to. I mean, everything in business is an investment. Absolutely. Some investments, hopefully more than not pay off, right? Right. Um, so whether you, you know, you buy a new truck, if you got landscape, right. that's an investment. And if that helps you cut more lawns and less breakdowns, that's right. good. But everything's an investment in business. And I think that's what some people lose sight of. The other thing is, I always tell people, um, if you're still doing X, Y, and Z, like admin task, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you're I don't know if anybody does this today, but if you're still inputting names on a spreadsheet, right, like right. in the old days, or doing anything that you could actually hire, sublet, or whatever somebody to do, whether it's 15 an hour, 25, or even 30 or $40 an hour for a really good VA, you're worth that 15, 20, or 35, 40 right. an hour. And if you want to, if you want a million dollars, you're going to generate like $400, you know, a, a, an hour. And what I right. call high revenue generating activity. So how to, that is a, I, I want to get into the mechanics of what you do also, but yeah. that is a mindset hurdle, is it not? Absolutely. It's a definitely a big mindset hurdle. And again, I always tell people, you know, hire for the thing or, you know, we hire a person that's going to help you get closest to the revenue first. And mm -hmm. also they can kind of pay for themselves. Right. And so in your example, if I hire somebody, you know, to help cut grass with me, that means we can cut more yards in half amount of time. That means if I can cut more yards, I make more money. Right. That's so right. Just using a very simple example and how people think about what it's going to cost. Um, and again, everything doesn't have to be I'm going to pay somebody for 40 hours full time. Maybe you start part time. Right. And you build yourself up. So what is the um, what's the short answer to whether somebody should hire an employee, a W-2 employee, taxes, all benefits, or just bring on a virtual assistant, which 1099 subcontractor, I guess, is probably the still proper definition of that. Yeah. So the short answer is how much do you want to control their work? And are you looking for somebody that you can train or somebody who's already like a subject matter expert in what they do? Mm. Um, and so a lot of times people starting out, if you're just now building a team, they want to go the 1099 right route. I will tell you that the, the higher you go in revenue and the more you want to scale your business, if you want it to continue to grow at some point, you do have to transition from contractor to W2 for most business models. Because you, there's going to come a point where you need more of their time and you're going to be not satisfied when they say, oh, yeah, I'll get to that. Or, yeah, I can do that in, in a week or so. You're going to want people to like, no, I want you to only focus on me. You know, And that comes mm. with growth. Um, but the short answer is how much do you want to control their time and their training and their expertise and things like that?
And it's not only um, just the amount of time, it's when. Like if you need something to be done at a certain time every day, that is dictating the hours. Absolutely. That technically is an employee. And that's why some people are getting into a sticky wicket there. But um, so, all right, let's say somebody does want to hire, uh, whether it's a part-time uh, subcontractor or whatever. What are, what are two or three steps that they should take in order to hire smartly? Yeah. So the first thing is your job description. That's the boring part. It's not sexy, but it's actually the foundation and where you should start, meaning making sure that your job description is really, really clear on what you need in terms of what are they going to be doing? And then also what competencies do they need to have? And so it's almost like the adage that says trash in, trash out. If Mm -hmm. you put trash out there, that's what you're going to get back. And what I see a lot of business owners do is that they don't take the time to think about what is it that I really need in this role? What role do I need first? And then also making sure it's not five jobs rolled in one. A lot of entrepreneurs do that as well. They want somebody Mm. to be the marketing person, the admin person, the research person, and the social media. Can I just have one person do it all? (laughs) Because it's so much easier. And they want to call them some (laughs) fancy title that nobody in the marketplace knows what that means. Yeah. (laughs) So a good job description, and then make sure that you have a really good interview process. If I had to kind of like just condense it into Mm -hmm. a couple of tips, those would be the two areas where I would really put a lot of effort. I'd be willing to bet you uh, a a nice dinner, we'll say, but. We, I don't even know where you live, but anyway, we'll make a nice bet or a friendly bet. Somebody that brought you on to have you help them said, Barbara, I just want to find a clone of me. Oh, yes. That not that it? I like, heard that today. <laughs> oh, did you really? Okay, yes. good. <laughs> and and, and in, in reality, you may want somebody with the same work ethic, et cetera, but I, you'll never find anybody that cares about your business as much as you. Right. And I also think that um, you want to hire somebody who's going to be good at what you're not good at. Absolutely. You you may be able to do, th- you may be able to write copy. You might be able to build a website. But I mean, when I built my first website in 2001, it probably took me 60 days. It was a hunk of crap, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to pay anybody. I mean, I have a much different mindset today. Um, but besides the money, uh, I do think, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, you want to hire somebody that will do the things that you don't want to do or maybe absolutely. the things you stink at. But absolutely. yet those are key to growth, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good point. I Again, I really, really just heard that today. Like, I really want somebody like me. And so, again, mm-hmm. I ask lots of questions because I want to get to the root. Usually when people say that, it's about how they work, right? Mm-hmm. I want somebody who has the same values that's going to communicate the way that I would communicate, you know, and things like that. But you're right. You want to hire for the things that you're not good at. Right. So I always say just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. You know, in your business, business, you have to really hone in and and spend the majority of your time focused on the things that only you can do as the CEO. If it's bringing a new business, if it's, you know, talking to the club, whatever it is that your zone of genius is what I call it. That's where you should be focused. Everything else you should be hiring and outsourcing for. Yeah. Um, I shared some a meme the other day and um, it was about when it's time to hire a coach, right? Mm-hmm. To help you. I think hiring a coach is equivalent to investing in speed. Somebody's going to help you get there faster, right? Right. And and somebody uh, replied, yes, but if you're smart, you can figure everything out. I, didn't, I don't like to no. engage back and forth, but I'm like, well, well, that is true. Um, but when I, when I, all of a sudden, when I had like 12 or 13 team members on, on my team for the various companies, somebody said, um, well, actually one of my assistants said, we need some kind of project management software. We've got people doing this, that, and the other thing. Right. And what do you want to do? I said, I don't have the first damn clue. You go figure it out. Right. right. I go, go research it, come back, tell me what the two or three options are. And then I let, I let her pick the one that she felt would do. And then she was in charge of it. Like, yep. could I go learn it? Yes. Could I eventually learn how to build a website? Yes. Did I want to do that? No. Right. So it's not about skill. It's about, in, you know, as I say, investing in speed. So what, what has happened? Um, well, even just the last three years, you know, the, the landscape has changed a lot in the last 10, but certainly the last three has shown so many business owners. You don't need to have employees working under your corporate umbrella or your roof <laughs> where they come to work. People can do very well working at home, right? We learned that through the pandemic. Absolutely. What, what else has changed on the landscape in, in recent years as far as hiring? 
Yeah. Um, benefits is one. So if you're hiring W2, you know, employees and not contractors, benefits is one that's really changed. People um, are really into work-life balance. They are really into having flexibility in how they do their work. So that's, you know, the remote options that's being able, you know, to work from home or work maybe Monday through Thursday schedule and off on Fridays, like people are into flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Um, also, when it comes to benefits, professional development, mental health amenities or days, things that's all centered around the person that gives them options to have time away from work is really, really big right now. Um, that's even sometimes more important than what you're paying them as a base salary. They want to know how much PTO do I get? You know, do I have flexibility to get professional development and you'll pay for it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and things like that. That's interesting. Um, I also hear that, and I don't know what all the generation letters used to be gener generation X. Now there's hundreds yeah. of them, but, <laughs> but th th what I'm hearing from some, some people that are younger than myself is people, they don't want to buy a house and settle down and have a job. They want to stay flexible and move around and just yeah. be mobile. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges for employers these days. Yeah, a lot of things to think about that you hadn't had to think about before. And especially if you think about the people that's hiring are of a different generation, a large part. So they're basing their proposal, their offers on what's important to them. And the person they're hiring is like, that's not important to me. You know, right. um, I want to be in on the beach and still working. And I want it to be a OK. And next week I want to be in New York. You know, I want to be mm -hmm. able like you said, to be agile and move around and still get my job done. Another thing that's really important with this um, current generation is being connected to the business and the mission. So there's a mm. lot of emphasis on what companies believe in, their social justice um, viewpoint, uh, what is their mission, are they big into the community, like all of that stuff matters. Like people want to work for somebody that they feel proud of and mm -hmm. that does something that aligns with their values, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you mentioned early on, probably 10 minutes ago, about writing. One of the first things to do is write a job description. How do you go about that? I mean, is it a long, drawn out paragraph? Just, you know, write as you speak? Or are you looking for bullets? Like, the, like what's the first step you should do? Yeah. So a uh, job description is going to have like four or five main parts. So one, have something about your company. So tell what your company does, what its mission is, and like what are the core values. So people have an understanding about what's important. Next, what job are you hiring for and what are the duties of the job? So they're going to make copies, they're going to file, like whatever the, the duties are. Mm -hmm. Then you want to have, a, and that should be in bullet points. Um, and then you want to have a section that talks about what are the job requirements? Do they need a degree? You know, do they need to have five years of experience managing a budget? You know, whatever the requirements are. And then the last section is usually on what we call job details. Okay. Is it a full-time job? Is it hybrid? Is it remote? Do they need to live in a certain place? What's the pay and what are the benefits? So you, you do want to list all that in the ad, right? The pay, yes. everything. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. Um, so when it, so let's say you place the ad, you're now getting a lot of uh, responses. W what are some of the screening techniques that you use? Cause I mean, you, you don't want to be a talking or interviewing, you know, a hundred people, God yeah. forbid you get a hundred responses, yeah. but what's that process look like? Cause again, you're at least in a small business environment, you're, you're pretty busy. Yeah. And so if you're a small business and you're not using, you know, people like me to help you in terms of having an HR support partner, then you're going to have what we call, usually I um, tell people to have a screening matrix. And so you're going to go back to your job description and see what the requirements are. And this is why the job description is so important. You have to have something to screen on. Mm -hmm. So if I said I want somebody with a bachelor's degree, five years of budget experience, must live in Atlanta, they must know um, Asana, and Zoom, like this is that's the four criteria that at least I have four things that I can screen on. So I'm going to look at the resume. Do they have those four things? Yes. Yes, pal. If they don't, no pal. Here's what happens with a lot of business owners. They don't think through what are the requirements and they put words like can communicate, can prioritize time management skills. You cannot screen on that off a piece of paper. You can screen on that in an interview. And so what happens is 
because the job description is not solid and clear, then when it's time to screen, they have no way of screening. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that that's the initial screening. Then let's say you want to bring some uh, half a dozen people in for yeah. an interview, right? What's that process look like? I mean, I haven't done this in so long, but I'm imagining there's certain things you can't ask anymore, yeah. <laughs> right? But there's certain things you want to ask to kind of f flush out or flush out some of the things that might be, you know, red flags or whatever. How do you train um, your clients to do an effective interview process or, you know, screening? Yeah. So again, the interview, again, it goes right back to the job description. That's why I said it's the most critical piece because your interview questions are going to be based on what you said you needed. So with the same example we just used for an interview question, if it's important to me that you have five years of budgeting experience, I'm going to ask a question. Tell me what has been the most challenging part of, of you know, operating a budget. Tell me what's the biggest budget you've managed and what were the pit, like whatever. So I'm going to ask questions specific to whatever it is that I require. If I'm looking for an innovative person, because that's one of our cultural core values, then I'm going to ask a question. Tell me about a time that you created a new process that wasn't there and tell me how you went about getting approval for it. Mm. Does that make sense? So yeah, I'm not every just question, asking. I'm sorry. Anything. Every question you just asked, suggested, Barbara, it was an open-ended question. I want to make yeah. sure people caught that. It's not like, have you ever had a budget? Yes. Have you ever, you know, you're, you're asking all open-ended questions, which I think is good. Yeah. And again, in the interview, you should have a mix of open-ended questions, behavioral questions, and hypothetical questions. So there's three different tiers. And again, all of that, if you're just a small business, you're probably not going to know. But again, when you hire someone like our team, we know it because that's what we do. And that's how we are able to get really good results and get a quality person. Another sticky wicket, I think, over the years, because we're a very litigious society, has been reference checking. Now it's like if somebody calls for reference, yes, they work here. These were the dates. This is what, you know, and they left. The, the, well, how did they do? They, they worked here. It's like you almost don't want to say anything because you're going to get yeah. sued for preventing somebody from getting a good job. That's right. So how do you check references? We don't. I only oh. do it if my, so I hate reference checks. Okay. If my clients insist that we do it, we do it for them. But in terms of if I'm um, engaging with a client and they ask me, hey, should I do one? I'm going to always say no because of that one, that reason that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But then two, people only put people who are going to say nice things. It's irrelevant, right? It just is. Wow. <laughs> so wow. it's like a thing. It's like what people used to do. But in this new world, I don't think that it's important. I don't think it's relevant because I'm only going to put people who are going to say nice things. And the people who are not going to say nice things can't tell me the truth because of legal laws. So what's the point? Wow. I mean, it's really, it's it's become a, a, a non-issue step, so to speak. There's just no reason for it. No, it's a waste. Of, and most people don't even call you back. Which which really compounds the the, the importance of the screening and the interview. Yes. Huh. So what are some of the pros and cons of working with like recruitment agencies, job boards, social media hiring, you know, firms like yours? I don't, I don't do, do recruiting. Or do you just yeah. teach people how to do it. No, I recruit. Okay. Yeah. So, so is that a, well, of course that's a good thing, Jim. She does it, but you know, talk about <laughs> how do you, yeah. How do you, the advantages and how do you work with a client? Okay. So the advantages are we're going to cut down the time and you're not going to have to spend your time and your effort trying to find the right person. So everything that we just talked about, you know, in very short snippets, job description, interview questions, the average business owner doesn't know that, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why when they do it on their own, they don't make good hiring decisions. And so one, you're going to get expert help and we're going to do it in probably a fourth of the time that's going to take you to do it. Um, so that's, that's why you would hire it out. And again, goes back to our conversation is hiring your zone of genius, right? It's yeah. not just, oh, this is my company. I want to bring somebody in. There is an art and a science to assessing talent and making sure that you're clear on what you need. A lot of times when people are hiring and it doesn't work out, it's not that the person is bad. It's because expectations weren't clear Okay. or I thought they were going to do four jobs. I'm like, well, nobody can do four jobs, you know? Yeah. Um, so what we do with our clients is that we take care of the whole process from beginning to end. The only time commitment that our clients have is 
one, to give us the information for the job description. Mm -hmm. So we do an in intensive job intake process so we know what you're looking for. And then they interview the top two candidates on the back end and pick who so they So you want. do everything else and then present Absolutely. the top two. See, that... Yeah. It's just really interesting. I love when I do an interview where I connect the dots because uh, I am my average listener, I think. <laughs> and what's interesting is once you make the decision to outsource some things, the first decision you make to outsource is to outsource hiring somebody to do that job, right? Because yeah. it's not your zone of genius, as you like right. to say. And it takes a lot of time. And okay. so you mentioned about if you get 100 resumes, that's very typical. If you put out an executive assistant position right now, you're going to get 200 resumes. Mm. Who has time to go through 200 resumes? No. You so don't. We have about five minutes left. I think I have about 30 questions left in my <laughs> rattling in my brain. But so the next thing I think that's important is um, onboarding, right? Because it is an investment to, to, to recruit, to possibly work with a firm like yours, and then bring them on. And if they don't make it, if they leave in 30 days or, or three months or whatever, that's a, that's a very a big cost to the business, right? Yeah. In terms of productivity, morale, and money. So what, what would be a good onboarding program look like to make sure somebody stays? Yeah, absolutely. So real quick, um, a couple of components is one, making sure that you think about onboarding as a process, not okay. just the paperwork that has to be done. And so typically the onboarding should at least be 90 days. And what that means is setting expectations, about this is your job, this is what we expect, and here's what we expect at the 30-day mark, 60-day mark, and at the 90-day mark. Um, also, frequent conversations or a pipeline of communication throughout the whole time. Hmm. If you're seeing a problem at 30 days, talk about it then. Don't wait till the 90 days and let it build right. up and let it fester. So frequent communication, frequent feedback, and then also as the owner or the leader, giving them the resources they need to be successful in the role. So if they their job is to work with five vendors, making that warm introduction, making sure they have access to the database, like whatever tools and resources they need, making sure they have that and you're bridging that gap. Um, Barbara, how does the whole um, remote work, flexible work, whatever you, you want to describe it, how did that must... I mean, you. I guess with Zoom, are you doing interviews? Because you could, somebody could hire somebody from Atlanta, live in Philly, or or Las Vegas. So you're not seeing anybody other than just on Zoom right. or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I think that's also a challenge for people. Um, maybe not younger generation, but maybe somebody my generation. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hire somebody that I have not met, and by the way, they're going to be working. You know a thousand miles away from right. my business that th does that is that something you have to work with now or or not so much with your clients i mean um no it's not a huge deal i have some clients that want the person even if it's a remote job they want them to be in the same city as them okay um so that they want to meet at a coffee shop and go through things i have and i would say out of all the jobs we do that's probably 30 percent. the rest are fully remote and they're fine with them being in one state and they're in another state okay it's just, yeah the norm very good. Well, you clearly know what you're talking about because um, it, here we are at the bottom of the hour. And I so I, I can always assess a good interview when I look up in the clocks like you're almost done, Jim. So um, I'm sure people have a lot more questions. By the way, folks, I did check out um, Barbara's blog. There's a lot of good information there. So why don't you give the website or email phone number, whatever you'd like to do for yeah. people that want to learn more and connect with you. Absolutely. So the website is www.careerpathwaysconsulting.com. And then you can find me on social on LinkedIn and Instagram under Barbara Mason. Um, I go live. There's lots of videos. There's lots of blog content, lots of free content for you to consume and just, you know, get you some quick answers. Or if you would love the opportunity to work with us, um, you can go to chatwithbarbara.com and get on my calendar. Do you go live regularly or frequently? Like whenever the mood strikes you. On Instagram, I'm on there pretty frequently, you know, I would say four or five times a week okay. um, in terms of videos and things like that. On LinkedIn, not as much. I have a lot of content, but I'm not live as much on LinkedIn. Yeah, I was just curious from a marketing standpoint, what's what's working for you. That's interesting. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. Really a great thank pleasure you. to having you on today. Very important, very important topic for entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, sir. Sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. It's been a day. Yeah. All right, folks, that wraps up this very special interview with my guest, Barbara Mason. You can connect with her at um, 
What's career? Say it again. Careerpathwaysconsulting.com. Careerpathwaysconsulting.com. Thank you. And um, someday, folks, I'll tell you why this has been a hairy day for me, but not right now. Anyway, you can connect with me at getjimpalmer.com, getjimpalmer.com. Again, if you're interested in joining me and about 25 other very smart entrepreneurs in the Dream Business Mastermind, that's dreambizcoaching.com. This interview will be up on my YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you'd like to share it with somebody who's in the same boat or you know somebody who needs some hiring help, that would be a good rather than say, oh, go find it on, on Facebook. So we'll we'll put that out tomorrow. Oh, by the way, all six of my books, my dream business books are free to you in digital format. They are absolutely free as Kindle. Yep. I knew how to do that. It's as Kindle and Barnes and Noble, they're Nook books. They're also in the iBook store. And that's it. Until this time next week, another fantastic interview. I am Captain Jim Palmer, the dream business coach. And you take good care. <laughs>